Welcome to the 83rd annual George E. Morrison Lecture in Ethnology. My name is Amy King and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Morrison Lecture Committee to this virtual event hosted by the Australian National University. I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and airwaves we meet this evening and to pay my respect to elders past and present. I'd also like to extend my welcome to any First Nations people who are present with us this evening. We're thrilled to welcome a truly global audience to this year's Morrison Lecture, with audience members coming to us from around Australia, Asia, Europe and North America. The Morrison Lectures were founded in 1932 by Chinese residents in Australia, including William Liu, Vice President of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce in New South Wales, and William Arquette, a Melbourne barrister and leader of the Chinese community in that city. They sought to commemorate George Morrison, who had served as a journalist and as a political advisor to the government of the new Republic of China in its first tumultuous years in power. The lectures were also founded with the goal of strengthening cultural relations and understanding between Australia and China at the time of the white Australia policy. For its first 10 years throughout the 1930s and into the early 1940s, the Morrison Lecture Series was hosted by the Institute of Anatomy here in Canberra. And after briefly lapsing during World War II, it was revived by Sir Douglas Copeland, the first Vice Chancellor of the newly created Australian National University. We are honoured that the ANU has continued to host the annual Morrison Lectures since 1948, with past distinguished speakers, including Wang Gungwu, Wen Xinye, the Dalai Lama, and the Honourable Kevin Rudd, then Prime Minister of Australia. As we continue this long-standing tradition, this year we are pleased to relaunch the Morrison Lecture Series in a slightly different online format. Doing so allows us to take those key goals of the Morrison Lecture Series, strengthening Australia-China relations and understanding of China at a time of heightened international tension to a much wider national and global audience. Following our lecture this evening, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. As this is a Zoom webinar, I'll invite you to post your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at any time during the lecture or immediately afterwards. And after the lecture, I'll put as many of those questions as possible to our speaker. When the Morrison Lectures were founded in 1932, Australia and China confronted a very turbulent moment in international order. Decades earlier, Australians like George Morrison had signaled alarm about Japanese imperial ambitions in China. And by the 1930s, it was clear that those ambitions would soon pave the way for a war between China and Japan and what would eventually become the global Second World War. It's particularly fitting then that tonight we welcome as our Morrison lecturer, a scholar who has been at the forefront of global efforts to understand the history and legacies of the Second World War in China. Rana Mitta is Professor of the History and Politics of Modern China at the Ox University of Oxford. As his title perhaps hints, Rana is distinct in our field as someone who has command not only of Chinese history, but also of the politics of how that history has been remembered and how it has shaped contemporary Chinese politics and society. Rana is the author of several prize-winning books, including Modern China, A Very Short Introduction, and A Bitter Revolution, China's Struggle with the Modern World. His two most recent books, the 2013 China's War with Japan, The Struggle for Survival, and his 2020 book, China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism, exemplify his ability to straddle both the history and politics uh, of, of China's war with Japan and how that has shaped politics and society in the 21st century. Beyond his writing and teaching, Rana has boundless energy for communicating his work to the widest possible audiences, as a regular radio and television presenter, not only on China, but also on arts and culture more broadly, as a host of, among other things, the BBC Radio 3's Night Waves for many years. His television documentary, The Longest War, China's World War II, was broadcast on the History Channel Asia in 2015. In 2023, Rana will leave Oxford to take up the ST Lee Chair in US-China relations at the Harvard Kennedy School. Tonight, Rana will be addressing the immediate post-war period in China, examining the debates about internationalism, identity and ideology 
that took place in China in the years immediately after the Second World War and the importance of those debates for understanding China today. I'm honoured to welcome Rana Mitter to deliver the 83rd annual George E. Morrison Lecture in Ethnology. Thank you very much indeed. And first of all, could I say uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us for this lecture today. I only apologise that it's not been possible for reasons that you will understand for me to zip over in the middle of term from uh, the UK to Australia. And I hope that this virtual presence will not in any way inhibit what should be, I hope, a very lively conversation about a subject of huge historical importance. Um, I'd like, if I may, to thank the organisers of the Morrison series of lectures. I am very aware of the distinguished nature of those who have uh, gone before me in this slot, and I'll do my best to try and live up to it uh, today. And while it would take the entire time that I have for the lecture to list the many friends that I uh, am very much uh, delighted to, to, to have in the uh, um, uh, audience today from uh, ANU, who I've known over the years, I will take a moment just to single out a couple, if I may. First of all, I'm delighted that the introduction and hosting of today's lecture comes from Amy, one of our most uh, brilliant students at Oxford over the last few, uh, well, decades, one might, uh, one might say, and we're all absolutely delighted that she has gone on to make such an immensely distinguished career for herself at the, uh, at the ANU. Um, we're also very glad, I know that one of the key organisers behind the scenes, Sharon Strange, also a brilliant organiser, no stranger to Oxford at all. And finally, I will add that, the, uh, as, as Amy has mentioned it, the Australian uh, National University's Centre for China in the World, as you mentioned, has a connection, of course, with uh, your own country's distinguished former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, and we're delighted that Kevin graduated uh, with his DPhil, which is what in Oxford speak we call the PhD, uh, from Oxford, in fact, just a few weeks ago, reminding us that the links between the UK, Oxford, China, and Australia are long lasting, and we hope in many ways, sometimes unexpected, but often very productive. So it's with that thought in mind that I join you this evening to give some thoughts about a period that I consider not only in and of itself very exciting, but one that I think actually has some, again, perhaps unexpected links with the contemporary world. And I hope that we'll straddle both the historical and the contemporary in terms of not only the lecture, but our discussion afterwards. And to do that, I'm going to hope that our cross-continental technology does what is needed. Good. Um, now, I think our technology is working and we have our title here of Internationalism, Identity and Ideology. And I'd like to start not that long ago, about a year ago, I think most of us will have been, as observers of China, fascinated by what was happening in Beijing just last week with the uh, 20th Party Congress. And that's a subject that may well come up in some part of our discussion. But I want to thrust your mind back a year or so ago to one of the first documents issued by Beijing, by the Chinese Communist Party, that in some ways set the stage for the events that we've seen unfold in Beijing just a few days ago. And in particular, I'm thinking of the resolution put out on, as the uh, party documentation put it, the major achievements and historical experience of the Chinese Communist Party. And that's pretty much a year ago, November 2021. Now, those who look at these things will tell you that there are very few such resolutions on the party's history that actually have ever been promulgated. One took place in 1945, uh, before the Communist Party had even come to power in China. Another took place in 1981 in the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution. But this one, in 2021, marks another stage in the historical development of the party. And for me, one of the things that made it interesting was the links to the era of that first resolution back in 1945. And I want to talk a little bit more about that world of 1945 and immediately afterwards. So a period that's often dismissed as a bit of a coda, a bit of an afterthought to the last years of the Republic of China on the mainland before it was defeated by the, or the, before the ruling nationalist Kuomintang uh, 
party of Chiang Kai-shek, was defeated on the mainland by the communists. I am going to suggest instead, and I know on this I think that our distinguished chair, uh, Professor King, is also, I think, uh, a, uh, an aficionado of the immediate post-war period after 1945. I think that actually it's a period that repays further examination in some key areas. And what I'm trying to do today is perhaps to spend about 10 minutes on each of these themes which I've um, outlined under the headings internationalism, ideology, and identity. The period of the post-1945 world in China um, is one that I've characterized um, in some of my writing as what I call the Chinese post-war. And the reason that I use that phrasing is that although we might think of it rightly as a period of civil war, a period when the Chinese revolution is coming to fruition, it's also worth noting that it's also the aftermath of that immensely traumatic and violent struggle against Japan, the Second World War, uh, in its China theater that would shape everything that came afterwards. I also mention the word post-war because it also, I think, reminds us that China's experience during even those few short years of the late 1940s also matches some of the experiences of other states, not least uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, the United States, France, which are more regularly thought of as having a post-war environment. It was, after all, a time when China become, became, a, as it is today, a P5 member of the UN Security Council. It was a time when some of the biggest global debates were about the links between economic and social development. It was a time when ideological uh, uh, concerns were to the forefront with the emergence of a worrying new phenomenon known as the Cold War. And of course, there were huge debates in China at that time about the meaning of this term democracy and what it might mean. In other words, the late 1940s was a period when some of the debates in China, about China and involving China were remarkably similar to those of the present day. And in other ways, of course, remarkably different. Um, the China of Xi Jinping, let me be clear, is not by any stretch the same China that Mao Zedong took over in 1949. Today's China is global, whereas that China was recovering from the aftermath of two, world war, uh, two huge wars. First of all, the war against Japan, then the Chinese Civil War. Today's China is a deeply consumerist society. The besetting characteristic of that late 1940s China was inflation and austerity, so perhaps closer to the Western world in some ways of, uh, of today. Today's China is, of course, an innovator in technology. The earlier version was, in contrast, desperate to find support, whether from the United States or the Soviet Union, to create its own ecology of development that would become autonomous over time, but was not so when it began. But nonetheless, the continuities do matter. And I think the word history is one of the ones that is most important in understanding how that longer trajectory is of interest to the party in putting forward its own message today about where it's come from and understanding the complexities, uh, the flaws, the ambiguities, which tend to be smoothed or ironed out of the bigger story that China tells um, about itself in the present day. And to suggest that continuity as well as change, in this talk, in this lecture, I've drawn on historical materials um, relating to figures with what I think are important insights into geopolitical and ideological change during that time. I'm not in this talk going to be addressing huge amounts of time to the very biggest names who are perhaps best known in this period, uh, Mao Zedong, Chiang Kai-shek, and others. I, I think they're very important, but I think that looking at some of the uh, materials of the second or even lower tier players can tell us a great deal about the way in which Chinese society and its place in the world was changing at that particular time. So let me give you a couple of examples there. On the left-hand side, for instance, we have a figure Wang Shijie, the foreign minister of China, one of the last nationalist foreign ministers under Chiang Kai-shek, 
Um, eventually, uh, uh, he would flee to Taiwan along with many of the other officials of that, uh, of that period. An intellectual, relatively liberal in his views, and actually an expert on constitutional law. He was the kind of internationalist that the uh, nationalist regime liked to draw in, a stark contrast in some ways to the very uh, harsh uh, view on individual civil liberties, which also characterized much of the party. In contrast, on the right-hand side, we have there a picture of Zheng Zhi, a young communist activist who joined the revolution at the age of just 15 in Hunan province and spent the next 20 years on the run. A powerful revolutionary figure in her own right, as her memoirs reveal, also married to a senior member of the Politburo Standing Committee of the era, uh, Tao Zhu. And to some extent, Wang Shijie symbolizes the kind of internationalism that marked the Chinese post-war, whereas Zheng Zhi, I think, in some ways, is an exemplar of the ideological shifts of that, uh, uh, of that, uh, of that period. In other words, for Wang Shijie and the foreign policy establishment of China, the immediate post-war years were a chance, perhaps a fleeting one, to try and reshape a Chinese role in international society. And for Zheng, Zheng Zhi and others involved in the communist revolution, it was a time of deep indeed profound, ideological refashioning. Early in his tenure as foreign minister, Wang Shijie, on the left there, was sent off by Chiang Kai-shek, the uh, Generalissimo, the leader of China, in August 1945, as part of a Chinese negotiation team that was going to do the hard yards of negotiation with Stalin about a uh, Sino-Soviet treaty. As Wang Shijie went off, he kept a little phrase uh, to m in mind that his daughter had in fact written for him. And that phrase was, don't be afraid of opposition. Remember, a kite flies against, not with the wind. An appropriate metaphor for a very turbulent time. So let me, before getting to some of the detail, just take a minute see if I can do it in 60 seconds, uh, perhaps two, in which I'll just summarize the key events of this particular period. Just a reminder of what was whirling around all of those actors involved with this very turbulent period. Between 1945 and 1949, you see in China the end of the war with Japan, negotiations between the two major parties, the communists and the nationalists, the Kuomintang, the Americans and Soviets both seeking influence in China, and the agreement by nationalist China of a Sino-Soviet agreement, they did eventually get one in August 1945, to try and limit Soviet demands in uh, Manchuria and in China beyond. But China also at that point took up its uh, P5 place as a permanent member of the brand new uh, United Nations Security Council, and in general, veered towards the American rather than Soviet position when it had to. General George Marshall was sent to China at the end of 1945, uh, trying to broker a peace uh, and, and the formation of a coalition government. His peace talks lasted for about a year, but essentially broke down on the inability of both sides to find any common ground. Meanwhile, the communists and the Chinese communists and the Soviet Union became closer. And as is well known, between 1946 and 49, the communists and nationalists fought a civil war. At first, it looked as if these superior nationalist forces might be able to consolidate, uh, destroy the uh, CCP's forces. But various factors turned the tide. And eventually, the KMT was destroyed by, uh, the nationalists were destroyed by poor military choices and economic chaos. And eventually, Chiang Kai-shek had to flee to Taiwan with the conquest of the mainland by the communists in 1949 with some outlying areas such as Hainan Island following afterwards. So that's the main narrative, you might, uh, uh, you might say. But it's worth noting that even during that period, a whole variety of initiatives started that would shape the, China, the, the destiny of China for many years to come, both internationally and um, domestically, and indeed across the divide of 1949 of the communist um, victory. So let's talk a little bit about Wang Shijie, the foreign minister that I mentioned there, who we still see on the left-hand side of the picture. 
It's worth noting that during his first year in office alone, Wang Shijie was part of at least three major negotiations. The first one I've mentioned, the team that, men- that visited Stalin in uh, Moscow in 1945. The second was his role in the team negotiating with American guidance, an attempted coalition government between the Chinese communists and Chinese nationalists. Both of those, to be fair, are fairly well known and fairly covered. The third set of negotiations, I think, has been less covered up to now. And they relate to Wang Shijie's attempts at a very fluid time in geopolitics to stake a claim for China, not just as a regional, but actually as a global power in the post-war world, to steal or adapt the famous words of former US Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, in his memoirs, to be not just present at the creation, but also to take a stronger role in the creation of an order that would stretch across continents. You have to bear in mind that Wang Shijie, like most Chinese, uh, at least educated Chinese at the time, whether they were nationalists or communists, absolutely believed that the titanic sacrifices that China had made, including millions of war dead and hundreds of millions of, ref- or tens of millions of refugees, as well as its refusal to surrender to the Japanese in 1938, uh, which could easily have, have happened at one point, that all of these were contributions that China had made to the global war against Japan and the Axis powers, and that the world now owed China something in return. And so perhaps the most extreme, even quixotic aim, you might say, during this period, was Wang Shijie's idea of pushing China forward as a power that might have influence in reshaping Europe. And he repeatedly pushed to get a place for China at the table. Second, and perhaps this was more achievable in the short term, was his desire to find a new mode of engagement with other countries in the non-Western world. So China could be a mentor to them, but also a rival or a leader. And Wang Shijie's daily negotiations show aspects of, of both of these, as we'll go on to, uh, to see in just a few minutes. But the principle that if the West, if the European and North American powers had a role in deciding how Asia would look in the post-war settlement, then in return, an Asian power could ask for a role in shaping the West, was an idea that was very dear to Wang Shijie's heart. And here we have a picture of one of those typical sorts of meetings. We have Wang Shijie there on the right-hand side, and he's meeting Vyacheslav Molotov, the notorious hardline foreign minister of the Soviet Union during this period. Now, it's fair to say that with characters like Molotov, and perhaps less hardcore, but nonetheless pretty determined to push their own interests, we have US Secretary of State uh, James Burns and uh, British Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin, none of whom you will perhaps be unsurprised to hear was particularly sympathetic to the idea that the state that was post-war China should have a role anywhere beyond its own backyard. But that did not stop Wang Shijie from pressing his claim. So, for instance, in September 1945, we see him uh, having an extensive conversation with Molotov about what was going to happen to trusteeship for North African colonies that had previously belonged to Italy, such as uh, such as Libya, and also ideas for um, the joint management of Japan. Uh, As we know, in the end, uh, Japan's control became essentially a matter of US occupation, but there was certainly a phase in which a Chinese role was not only possible, but one that Molotov thought might be a useful carrot to dangle in front of the Chinese to get them to follow Soviet intentions more strongly. Wang Shijie also used negotiations at uh, meetings such as the London Foreign Minister's meeting and uh, uh, follow-up meetings to draw on China's own recent history to essentially put forward lessons for what should be done in Europe. So in late September 1945, a French proposal was put forward to separate part of northern Germany as part of the um, European post-war settlement. And Wang Shijie uh, noted in his diary that, quote, I said that that wasn't right. If the people who lived in that region did not desire to separate from Germany, I talked about the principle of nationalism, which should not be neglected even on the territory of your enemy. In other words, an ideological preference, still very visible today, of course, that national identity matters and that the splitting up and uh, destroying of agreed geo-bodies and nation-states was not something that should be undertaken 
lately. And again, it is, I think, indicative and interesting that Wang Shijie would choose to say this about the territory of Germany, a country which, of course, had been comprehensively defeated as part of the Axis powers. He went on also to insist that when the foreign minister's meeting went on to discuss highly European-centred matters, such as the Balkans, or indeed the fate of Italy, that, quote, China could not be excluded from, uh, from this. And again, if this seems fanciful in the world of 1945, and certainly the European foreign ministers, uh, indeed the, the US Secretary of State, regarded this as uh, somewhat tiresome talk, they weren't particularly inclined to indulge uh, Wang Shijie, it is worth remembering that a mere 80 years later, one of the great conversations that was taking place in geopolitics just a few months ago was the question of why today's China wasn't doing more to intervene in the current war between Russia and Ukraine. So in slightly more than three quarters of a century, we've moved from a Chinese foreign minister wanting to reshape war-torn Europe, being told it was ridiculous, to a world in which at least some actors want China to intervene in a war-torn Europe and then get surprised when the Chinese foreign minister says it's none of China's business. The civil war, of course, in China was one of the major factors that interfered with any idea that China could establish a stable and effective international position of, uh, of influence. And this was one of the things that uh, managed to essentially uh, lay a claim on China's part to a greater role in international society, but nonetheless also undermined it. In other words, the idea that if the nationalists could somehow uh, end up with a stable coalition government in a position of dominance in China, this would be a uh, stepping off point for their new role, both regionally and internationally. But until the civil war had been um, resolved, this couldn't be something that they would actually be able to develop very, very strongly. Nonetheless, it's worth noting in 1945 and 1946 that the narrative of China's global role is one that Wang Shijie felt was a primary part of the uh, idea that he wanted to push about China's global role. There were also less abstract and more immediate goals that he had in mind, at least one of which has a tremendous amount of resonance in the present day. So here is a uh, statement again from Wang Shijie's diary about an issue which continues to haunt the region, the South China Sea. And I think, again, many of those uh, who no doubt are quite China expert on uh, this, uh, listening to the lecture, will be aware that it's become a commonplace that the 1940s and the pre-communist period under the Kuomintang was actually a, a turning point in terms of Chinese attitudes towards uh, their possessions in the South China Sea. So that makes um, Wang Shijie's uh, uh, notes from uh, January 1947, I think, particularly um, uh, important in this context. Wang Shijie takes a very robust line during this period on maritime claims. And here, as you see this quote, which I've uh, translated, but I'll just read it here, talking about the Paracel Islands, the Xisha Islands, still very much at the heart of the South China Sea controversy today. And he says, we have always, and he's talking not, of course, about a clash between China and um, uh, Vietnam or, uh, um, uh, 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 or Indonesia, but uh, regarding colonial France, which, of course, was still the uh, imperial power in Indochina at that point. So Wang Shijie says, we've always claimed the Xisha, or Paracels, archipelago as our territory, but we've never yet set, set up officials or sent workers there to stay there on a regular basis. The French government recognises it as Vietnamese territory. After Japan's surrender, we sent a small number of troops to the important island at the heart of the archipelago, known as Woody Island, to occupy it. Recently, the French have sent a military ship to the island to scare our troops residents there, a resident there, but after my intervention, they withdrew. This is going to be a dispute between China and France. Now again, the parallels here, as well as the differences, are instructive to, uh, to note. Clearly, the uh, confrontation with uh, colonial France is no longer an issue in the present day. But nonetheless, some of the tactics, including who occupies islands, uh, how much previous usage there's been and so forth, 
are part of the maelstrom of international lawfare, as it's sometimes known, between the parties involved in that particular, uh, that particular set, of, uh, set of disputes. And the engagement with trying to reshape the territory of uh, China's, um, uh, of, the, of the Asian neighborhood around China, becomes very much a theme of that particular era. Uh, I've given you there one of the perhaps more confrontational elements in terms of laying claims within the South China Sea. But you also see at this time repeated visits by the nationalist figures of an emerging either uh, anti-colonial or post-colonial Asia treating the newly uh, restored and sovereign Republic of China, which don't forget was still one of the very few independent Asian countries uh, in 1945, as an important touchstone. So the visit of former Thai Prime Minister Pridi Banongyom uh, in November 1946, as Wang Shijie puts it, the first time an important figure like this from Thailand has visited China. Uh, April 1947, Syngman Rhee, uh, later of course to become the um, authoritarian president of South Korea. Um, and uh, of him, uh, Wang says, his thinking is a bit conservative, which is a bit of an understatement, but his spirit of struggle is very strong. Up to now, Korea has not had a government organized by Korean people. And that, of course, is his point, that again, the emergence of new Asian nationalisms very much um, on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the up during much of the 20th century are not interrupted, but rather enhanced by 1945. Uh, Some of his comments can be a bit patronizing. Um, in spring 1947, negotiating a treaty, of Philippine, a treaty of friendship with the newly independent Philippines Republic, um, uh, Wang Shijie characterizes the Philippines as, quotes, lacking experience and understanding, largely because they were not willing to, I think, sign off uh, the treaty with China in quite the terms in which uh, Wang Shijie would have wanted. But nonetheless, the broad sense that there is a newly emergent presence of China in the region helping to shape it becomes important. And a whole variety of other uh, events at that time, such as the setting up of transnational and UN-linked organizations, notably ICAFI, the um, Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East, um, which um, became essentially a center for the, for the starting of discussion of what eventually would become one of the most important tasks of the United Nations in Asia, economic development uh, across, uh, across borders. Also, of course, you get the emergence of uh, new or reconstituted legal organizations, perhaps most famously the Tokyo Trials of 1948 involved the Chinese nationalist judge, Mei Ru Ao, who in some ways symbolized that wider presence of an internationalized cosmopolitan um, professional class uh, in service of the nationalist government's post-war um, agenda. Nonetheless, we know that this was not a period that lasted very long, less than five years until the communist victory. So why should it matter that you have this emergence of at least an attempt at creating a new internationalized transnational role for a post-war China? And I think for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the principle that was set up that China should be a global actor that is different, I think, after World War II as compared to before. China, of course, did have, through uh, famous diplomats such as Wellington Koo, a real role at the uh, League of Nations in the pre-war period. But the genuine sense that China could be at the top table really dates from its uh, place as an allied victor in 1945, even though the victorious regime, the nationalists, didn't have very long to enjoy that, uh, uh, that status. What, of course, China did not have at that point, which was essential to its global aims, and what it does have now, of course, is significant economic resources, and that provides a very important point of difference. But the second point is that the competition for China as an influencer on other Asian nations also uh, inflected in a very, very important way during this period. In other words, at a moment when even India would not be independent for two years, and other actors would take longer to emerge from the last period of colonial rule in Asia, the presence of China as a sovereign actor, an allied victor, and the only, you might say, non-European or non-Western holder of a seat at the top table of the United Nations 
was of real as well as symbolic importance. I want to spend a little time now shifting to the other two I's, identity and ideology, in my talk, having just said something about the I of internationalism. Now, as I've said, at the heart of Wang Shijie's project, or rather the project that he was central to, it's a bigger project than just him, but he's a good uh, person to concentrate on, was the placement of China as a global actor. And as I've said, that idea has tremendous amounts of resonance in the present day. But that was by no means, of course, all that was going on in the Chinese post-war. And I think one of the things that is worth remembering is quite how much ideas mattered. And I use that phrase rather than ideology, although, of course, ideology is related to it, because ideology often sounds like a rather stale thing, something that's a framework that contains rather than a set of understandings that enables. And it's worth noting that when we read often the rather turgid records of Marxist and other ideological discussions during this period, that they did for many people, not for all, but for many people, relate to real and very, very urgent issues to do with social equity, with China's place in the world, and with the fast-changing nature of China's um, battle for a new form of governance. In other words, the ideas that lay behind the ideology remain important and sometimes uh, are underplayed in an era when perhaps, at least until recently, we've come to think that ideology is perhaps um, uh, uh, um, a language that obscures rather than being something that authentically carries the, um, the sense of a real political um, project. And so we can do that, I think, by looking at least some of the people who were caught up in the way in which ideas and a changing ideology, a revolutionary ideology of communism in particular, Chinese communism, uh, linked with real experienced lives. Uh, back at the beginning, I showed you a picture of uh, Zheng Zhu, a young woman who, as I've said, in, 19, uh, in at the age of 15 in 1926, went on to a very turbulent life, both in underground CCP politics and indeed in life in general. Um, let me introduce you now to a couple of other people whose writings I think are uh, of, um, of great relevance to, uh, to, to this. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have um, Yang Siyi, mid-level People's Liberation Army cadre. Uh, at the time of the 1940s, you can see from his uh, uh, dates, um, he would have been uh, in his 40s, he was in his 40s, um, and he was a figure who was mostly based in uh, Zhejiang, in uh, East Central China. Liu Yanjin, on the uh, right-hand side, uh, was also attached to the People's Liberation Army, the PLA. Very different sort of job and very different sort of age and stage. She was a performer in a propaganda troupe, a sort of entertainment troupe. Uh, she, as you can see from her dates, was merely in her very, late, uh, very early 20s at that, uh, at that point. One thing that they have in common is that, as with many uh, cadres at that time, they both kept diaries, uh, and the diaries are extraordinarily interesting. Um, I will not go into sort of huge details here about how one can assess them as uh, to where they're reliable and where, where they're not. But overall, it's worth noting that Liu Yanjin's in particular uh, was actually not available for uh, anyone to read until many, many years after she had written it, and therefore has a sort of quite um, frank nature about it that might not be the case for a more ideological sort of diary that was written uh, for um, consumption by party cadres and officials. And one of the reasons that I think these diaries are so interesting is that, as I'll show you in a moment, they incorporate many aspects of the kind of language that we often think of as jargon, the sort of Marxist language, which in some ways seems almost separate from what you might think of as natural or real language. And I think part of the point is to remember that much of the way in which revolutionaries shaped their own consciousness was very much tied up with the ideological world in which they lived. In other words, I don't think it's necessarily meaningful to look for a separate sort of individual liberal subjectivity that sits entirely separate from a sort of uh, Marxist carapace. The context of this, of course, was the Civil War, which broke out in earnest in 1946 and remained raging for the next um, three years. 
And one of the things that's most fascinating about the diaries is the way in which, in some ways, they undermine the expectations that come from propaganda accounts of the Civil War, many of which, at least on the victorious side, are about the spontaneous uprising of the masses and their willingness to actually join the, uh, join the revolution. In contrast, some of the most interesting parts of Yang Xi's early diaries are about something that isn't much discussed in that context uh, in later accounts, which is desertion from the PLA. Um, again, you know, there are plenty of accounts, but I take one that comes from a particular base area in Zhejiang in late uh, 1945. And essentially, of 1,800 troops recruited at one point, something like 10% of them had simply run away within a few days. And Yang Siyi reflects a bit on what these folks are up to. And this is what he says in his diary. The majority are good comrades. There are many reasons for such a serious reduction of numbers, but it's partly because their leaders and section chiefs uh, have not united. The warlord residue of their leadership style and their emotional complicity that is dragging people into projects they don't really want to do. These are the main reasons. The military leaders and political commanders don't get on well, and this reflects the abnormality between the party and the masses. Now, in the present day, it would be hard, far harder to argue that there is any sort of flaw or distortion between the party at the top and the wider population as a whole. But in this case, a very real life phenomenon, the fact that people didn't often, or men, didn't often like being recruited to the PLA and would do their best to get back to their home villages, had to be addressed head on because it was a real problem in terms of recruitment and uh, motivation. And indeed, a whole variety of tactics are used, including um, uh, both coercion and, uh, of course, ideological persuasion to try and get people's, uh, people better trained in terms of their presence in the, uh, in the PLA. The masses continued to be a problem through much of this, um, much of this period, and Yang Si in another entry reports that, um, somewhat to his surprise perhaps, when they had liberated a particular town, Quotes, we didn't see any of the masses welcoming us, and our section didn't go through the streets, but just stopped at the street corners. So some of our comrades, he says, were not very happy about the indifferent attitude of the masses, and considered that actually they, had got, they the troops, had gone to too much effort in dressing up smartly for the benefit of the, uh, of the masses. And a few days later, they hold public meetings, the intention of which is to correct what they call the, quotes, partial consciousness of the masses, a phrase which, of course, means basically people really not that concerned about the political ideology of whoever it is that turns up, as long as, for the most part, they are left to get on with their, uh, their own lives. In other words, there is a sort of sense of a real ideological project that needs to be pursued through uh, the, uh, the lens of someone like Yang Si, as opposed to the rather kind of glorious um, and um, uh, stylized version of the revolution, which one sees in many of the retrospective accounts, even some of the official memoirs, in which essentially the masses were yearning to break, break free and needed only the vehicle of the party to bring them in that particular, uh, particular direction. The preoccupations of 1945 were evidently very different from those of now, but the idea of the party cadre who's monitoring the political, ideological, and emotional temperature of his charges is very much part of the way in which party solidarity is enacted even today, again, in a much more ideological um, time. One of the things that, again, is notable in many of the self-assessments through diaries and uh, other such documents of this time is the way in which political ideology is used to deal with personal flaws. And again, uh, Yang Si's diaries give um, a lot of time to his reflection on what he calls his big flaws. So one example is he writes, when someone hurts my petit bourgeois self-regard, I lose patience, or at least I feel unhappy inside. And he put his flaws down to a combination of what he called petit bourgeois weakness and peasant narrowness. The answer to this, as he put it, was uh, political study and daily self-reflection, something which, of course, sounds very much like the idea of Xiuyang, uh, self-cultivation, uh, drawn from the Confucian past, but also, of course, adapted by communist um, officials such as uh, Liu Xiaoti, whose How to Be a Good Communist uh, has many aspects in its self-help uh, tactics that are drawn from a much longer Confucian past. But 
Even so, it is very clear that the idea is, uh, is Maoist and not Confucian in terms of the kind of transformation that is sought. And in one of his more homely moments, uh, Yang Si adds in a diary, quote, I feel that my petty bourgeois weakness and self-regard is like the stinkiness between my toes. It's hard to wash away. A different view comes from Liu Yanjin, the young woman whose picture I showed you, born uh, in the 1920s, so in her early, twen uh, early 20s by the, the late 1940s. And she found herself at that point in a deep relationship in which uh, the feeling was stronger on her part than that of the man she was in love with. And in her case, you see a huge mixture of a strong desire to strengthen her own ideological um, solidity with the wider sense that she still wants to indulge in the kind of um, romantic relationship, which also has been part of the way in which she has come to imagine, uh, imagine uh, her love life. And it's notable that these come together in a rather turbulent, traumatic way on an occasion in 1946, when she discovers that her, uh, as she thinks, intended fiancé has actually gone off and married someone else. And her account of that in her diary is interesting, I think, in the way that it combines the ideological and the, the personal. When she writes, uh, she writes to her lover as if she was sort of addressing him, don't you have a Bolshevik morality about love? You should use a robust party spirit to evaluate yourself. What kind of demon is troubling your mind? You should do more self-inspection. And one can't, I think, doubt the sincerity of this, um, uh, these sorts of sentiments which are expressed at some length, but also note the way in which the framework of ideological language so deeply shapes the way in which she considers even something uh, like her own, um, uh, own personal romantic, uh, romantic life. After all, romance and indeed violence in revolution were hardly optional extras, but part of a wider sense that the whole project had, um, uh, had come together to transform society. And that links, of course, with the day-to-day -day, uh, experiences of many of those who took part in the revolution and indeed many of the aspects that came to a head during the Civil War and beyond, such as land reform. We see many accounts also during this period, at the same time that Wang Shijie is flying around the world trying to um, gain uh, presence for a global China, that at the same time, uh, the countryside of China, particularly in the north, is being subjected to what uh, at least one um, uh, 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 writer, Zheng Zhi, the, uh, the uh, revolutionary woman I mentioned at the, the beginning, called a wild wind, a kuangfeng, from the north with orders uh, to sweep out the various households in which landlords had been dominant and were now having their property seized and being thrown out of their, um, out of their homes. So during that period, the ideological fierceness of land reform and social revolution coexisted with the reinvention of the self in terms of the changing nature of person personal relationships and the continued, if seemingly, more and more doomed project of the nationalist government trying to establish itself in the world while winning a civil war which it seemed increasingly unlikely to be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to win. And this is notable if we come back to some of what the Kuomintang characters are saying about this particular period in history. One of the things that's notable even about the communist diarists, while they are doubtful about their own flaws, doubtful about some of the problems to do with recruitment and the continuation of the revolution, there's never any doubt they think they're on the right side. They think that their project is going to be one that ultimately leads to a successful revolution, and in that they are, of course, ultimately uh, correct in their assessment. In contrast, many of the diaries of the key figures in the Gomidang at this time are very upfront and very frank about the fact that they think they have increasingly hitched themselves to a losing project. A couple of quotes from Wang Shijie, uh, his diaries from 1947, about you know uh, half a year into the increasingly problematic civil war, where he says, I feel extremely gloomy about the future of the current political situation, or the core people in our party don't have any genuine conviction when it comes to uh, democracy and constitutional government. 
So these sorts of things bring to mind that we have a real clash of ideologies during this period, but the ideologies are also linked very strongly to changing social conditions. In other words, we might adapt Marx slightly and say, people do make their own propaganda and ideology, but they don't make it exactly as they please. We need to understand not just as might seem to make common sense that the nationalists were downhearted, the communists felt positive about being on the rise, but also how that sense of ideological fulfillment or lack of it manifested itself in reality, as we see in the words of Yang Si or uh, Liu Yanjin, or the absence of that sentiment in the words increasingly of Wang Shijie. Propaganda and um, and political language, after all, do not sit free-floating, but they sit in the middle of a social and economic reality that then shapes emotion and outward projection. So let us keep those thoughts in mind as we turn, perhaps in the last few minutes, back towards the present day and think about how some of these questions of language, of ideology, and of global presence still reflect, I, I think, are, are refracted through the politics of contemporary China. After all, let us take a phrase that has been very much in the news in the last few weeks. It disappeared a little bit in the last year or so, having been introduced last year, but reappeared in last year's party congress, and that's common prosperity, gong tong fu yu. Now, of course, it is an economic phrase, and it's one whose history long predates Xi Jinping. But that idea of the common nature of that prosperity is all about something rather bigger, a return to cultural norms that in some ways have been shaped by the revolution. In other words, it's not just a return to some kind of uh, ill-defined pre-modern tradition. And the link, at least as it's put forward, between the desire for relative equalization of incomes and more controversial projects such as removing individuation in ethnicity or in varied political viewpoints is also part of the same project. Commonality can stretch across everything from economics to emotion. And as in the earlier era, whether it's the 1940s or the, or the 2020s, seeing what people say about these ideas when they internalize ideology as part of their identity is important. A revolution that threw norms up in the air and could produce figures such as Liu Yanjin and uh, uh, Zheng Zhu, also uh, understood the need, as they saw it, to overcome something they defined as a bourgeois norm, and yet in practice found that the lived reality of everyday life meant that they struggled to do so in practice. So does that, any of that mean that today's CCP, Chinese Communist Party, and its adherents are using the same language that they did in the 1940s. And I would say, no, that's not the point. Just the discontinuities between the two sides are hugely significant. But it is important to note that there is a continuity in the overall project. When the CCP, using a phrase which, frankly, has many disturbing aspects, zai jiao yu, re-education and reshaping of the minds of its new members, or of members of the Chinese community who have not yet been brought under the party's rule, whether it's a 40-something Yang Siyi or a 20-something Liu Yanjin, this is something that is real and has continuity over time. The relationship between how people, particularly those who have chosen to participate in political projects and their governments, work is a clear one. And the conviction of communist activists back in the 1940s was not simply a fiction designed to hide some other version of politics, but an ideological reality for them. In other words, it is a construction, but it is not inauthentic for that reason. And that is why 1945 to 49, I think, is relevant to thinking about the increasingly ideological moment that China is in now. Because then, too, it was on the cusp of a new era one that defined politics and redefined politics in very significant, indeed profoundly transformative ways. Xi Jinping has also chosen, through uh, also ideological figures such as Wang Huning and others, to define his period in power as a new era. Albeit, as that resolution we started with points out, one that simultaneously seeks to create 
a continuity with the founding of the party back in 1921. In other words, a story that has no road bumps along the way. But I think remembering that late 1940s period, a period when China briefly but significantly did seek a global identity, did seek a new type of economic and social settlement, and did seek to try and refine its, uh, define itself in the context of the post-war, even though it does not remain either noted or particularly celebrated in the discourse of today's Chinese Communist Party, uh, largely because it, con it concerns its old political opponents, the nationalists, nonetheless reminds us that actually the story of Chinese modernity and the progression over the last century and beyond is a much more complicated and in many ways much more ambiguous story than the rather brassy certainties of propaganda can sometimes make us, well, choose to make us believe. Thank you all very much for your attention today and I'd be delighted to hand back to our chair, uh, Dr. King, for uh, some discussion uh, now for the, uh, the next period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rana. Now we've come to the moment um, in, in the seminar this evening uh, where it's time to open up to, to questions from our audience. Uh, we have a very distinguished audience. I'm not sure if everyone can see the, the list of participants with us, but they are luminaries from around Australia and, and the world. So please don't be shy um, and please do put your questions in the Q&A function uh, so that I can put them to our speaker. While you're gathering your questions, um, Rana, let me say thank you for, for a really wonderful, really stimulating uh, lecture, um, traversing the sweep from the 1940s to the present day uh, and those themes of internationalism, ideology and, and ideas uh, and language. Um, a question that, that comes to mind immediately for me is, is one that's actually somewhat coincidental. Um, just by pure chance, this morning I happened to be reading uh, some of Wang Shijie's writings um, on the idea of self-reliance, Zili Gangsheng, which is something we typically associate with the Communist Party um, and, you know, ideas that they developed during the, the Yan'an period and, and beyond. But in fact, you know, as I've been discovering, Wang Shijie and others in the Guomindang were also thinking about this idea of self-reliance for themselves in the 1940s. And so I guess my, my this inspires my question to you, which is, you know, how internationalist were the communists and how ideological were the Guomindang? Um, you know, you, from the from the source materials, the diaries you, you, you've pointed to, clearly the Guomindang and, and people like Wang Shijie were on the world stage in a way that uh, people like Zheng Zhe um, and, and uh, Yang Xi and others were not. Uh, but was there that, that kind of call to internationalist vision uh, amongst the communists at this time? Do you see any evidence of that? Um, and how much uh, were, were thinkers like Wang Shijie reflecting on those sort of ideological tensions at home? Uh, Amy, thanks for a, a great question. Clearly, I think what we're establishing here is that there's no better way to start the morning than reading a bit of Wang Shijie's diaries, no doubt. Perhaps we could institute this as our own form of, uh, of ideological education. Who, who can say? Um, I think it's a, a really interesting and important point. I would say that if we are looking for what you might call evidence of a, of a global outlook or an internationalized outlook, you can certainly see it in both the communist and the nationalist worldviews. Now, Wang Shijie is you know, different in one sense because he is the foreign minister of China during those three years. And of course, of necessity, his role is one that is very embedded in making China's case. And that's why he you know, does make a very good case study for understanding what that might, uh, might be. And actually most ordinary Guomindang cadres, let alone communist ones, are not necessarily involved in that world in a, in a big way. But to take one aspect that I didn't really have time to do in the lecture, but I'll just, just sort of you know, say one or two words about, about now. I have actually been really um, you know, struck by the way in which communist cadres of this period, whether they're you know, writing diaries or you know, keeping memoirs of what they did or you know, giving accounts to the party of what, they, what they've been up to, do place themselves in a variety of internationalized contexts. But from their point of view, obviously, it doesn't involve foreign travel, which is unlikely expensive and you know, frankly very rare in that era. It involves reading. It involves watching movies. It involves basically reminding ourselves that and as you all know, a lot of the people who've done work on the Republican era in China will point out that the world does come to China, but it comes to China in many ways, not just through the presence of foreigners, many of whom, of course, have disappeared by the end of the World War II period because they're, you know, they, they're, it's, it's no longer a congenial place to be. 
but, they, uh, but, but also through a whole variety of cultural artifacts. And that can operate in more than one way. It can be very heavily Soviet influenced, as one could imagine. So uh, Liu Yanjin, the young woman I've mentioned, she's a big fan of Soviet pulp fiction. You know, she imagines herself in some of her little entries saying, gosh, I really admire this, you know, woman's called Anastasia, who basically refuses to take uh, one of the czarist uh, cavalry officers as a lover, and instead, you know, kind of think dies in a hail of bullets as she's uh, defending her red regiment uh, against the oncoming uh, imperialists. Uh, you know, uh, Liu Yanjin sort of reads this and writes, gosh, I wish I could be like that. Um, beyond that, you also have actually quite a lot of accounts, in Kuomintang uh, um, accounts too, of um, watching, for instance, American and British films and uh, seeing a wider world that emerges on the cinema screen as a way of understanding how, uh, how things are at that, um, at that time in the wider world. Um, bearing in mind, actually, that that comes to mind, you also have some of the, the records amongst young communist women who are worried about the fact that they still like the Shanghai movie magazines, you know, because they're given this cosmopolitan view of life, but it doesn't, you know, that's like the stinky toes, you know, it's part of the petty bourgeois consciousness that needs to be washed away, and instead they should be watching these, these Soviet, um, Soviet movies. And one other thing, it's also worth noting quite how many of the young men who were called up uh, in the, on the Kuomintang side to fight in the Civil War had lots of combat experience in places like India and Burma, where they had been sent in the last years of the war. Um, there's a brilliant book actually by um, Cao Yin of Tsinghua University. It's come out just uh, in English actually, with Oxford University Press, uh, called I think Sojourners in the Raj, which is about Chinese soldiers who were trained in India during World War II. And it's one of the first, well not the first book I think, which uses both the Chinese and Western sources. I've just read it and highly recommend it. It's, it's very, very good. So that's just a reminder that you don't have to be elite to be international during that period. Ordinary combat soldiers and young women watching movies are also part of that sort of idea that China exists in the world in a much broader broader sense. And all of that feeds back again into the wider political mission of what a, a converted China is going to, to be once it's had its revolution. Thank you. And I, I, I honestly don't think I'll ever forget the idea of petty bourgeoisness being linked to stinky toes. It will, <laughs> it will stay with me. Let me let me put some questions to you now from our audience. Um, sticking with this theme for a moment, um, a question from Sophia Woodman. Isn't the ideological language used by your communist diarists also an indication of the way that they are embedded in an internationalist or transnationalist project? Very good question from Sophia, thank you. Um, yes, it absolutely is. And I think I'd use it as a very clear example of, um, I mean, let's dig into that a little bit more because I think it shows, at least for me, something interesting. In China in the 20th century, there is more of an explicit problem about being able to combine the recent past with a new form of ideological framework as compared to, let us say, India another country which has um, a nationalist, it's not a revolution perhaps, but an independence movement. And the independence movement, which is in the, as we now know, is embedded in a whole variety of what you might call indigenized political concepts. The Gandhian vocabulary is perhaps the most famous, Ahimsa, Shatyagraha, uh, Swaraj, etc. We now know more partly because of the, you know, the, the rise of Hindutva in, in, in India that actually that sort of Hindu nationalist vocabulary has a longer past history too. That didn't suddenly emerge in you know, 2015 or something. It existed also as part of the, um, uh, the anti-imperialist movement but was downplayed because of its secular, its, its uh, sectional and anti-secular nature. But it's also drawn very much from a variety of, um, uh, of sources that exist within India. In China, the May 4th phenomenon at its most extreme form, which is the rejection of the past, does, I think, change the terms of trade when it comes to thinking about politics. Now, one of the things, and you know, I've written about this myself, but other people also have written about it, I think, with, with you know, more, more expertise, um, is not by any means as complete in its rejection of the past in the early 20th century as some of the earlier writings uh, of you know, 30, 40 years ago might have said. We actually know there's plenty of adaptation of Confucian thinking as well as simple rejection of it. But nonetheless, the trend towards arguing that the past as a whole was unworthy and needed to be rooted out was stronger overall in the Chinese political discourse than it was, let us say, I think, in the, in the Indian one. It's a big statement there, feel free to push back, but just to sort of set the framework out. I say that to point out that that provides a space for the, for, for the phenomenon that I think that Sophia is um, uh, indicating, which is the space has to be filled from elsewhere. 
And in that context, the idea of internationalized political discourses, which can fill the space, becomes that much more important. The thing that is interesting about, um, of course, the, <coughs> excuse me, the version of Chinese communism that emerges during that period is both that it's deeply rooted in many ways in the history of China itself. You know, it's as much a national project as it actually is an international project. But at the same time, it's also able to adapt some of these terms that clearly are not drawn from an indigenous Chinese political repertoire, petty bourgeois individualism being an obvious example thereof, um, but does so in a way that fills a space that is necessary for people to actually code and uh, uh, rationalize the real political circumstances that they see and feel around them, exploited peasants, women being oppressed in bourgeois society, or whatever else it might be that they struggle against, but need a vocabulary actually to articulate in terms of political project. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move ever so slightly forward in time for our next question. Um, and while I do, I'm also encouraging uh, our audience members to continue putting your questions in the, in the Q&A uh, section. Um, a question, though, from my, from my ANU colleague, Benjamin Penny, who asked if he might say something about Wang Shijie's time after he had gone to Taiwan and his ideas mm. about China's place in the world, um, mm. especially considering uh, that the Republic of China, of course, held the China seat at the UN uh, for some time after 1949. Could you tell us a little mm. bit about sort of the legacy, I suppose, after 49 for, for Wang Shijie and others? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Benjamin. Uh, th that, that's a question I'm really fascinated by. I'll, I'll answer it, if I may, by widening the scope slightly, because um, Wang Shijie is a really interesting character, but he's just one of a range of people who become briefly prominent, and in some ways prominence because of their anomalousness. And that's what I'd call the Western educated, cosmopolitan, relatively liberal nationalist party elite who sit almost as a sort of uh, 90 degree, at a 90 degree angle to the much more authoritarian, hardline, and not at all liberal mainstream of the Kuomintang party, which is symbolized by people like the Chen brothers, Chen Lifu, Chen Guofu, and, and others. And there are quite a few of those people, all of whom I think you know, have interesting things to say about that period. So Wang Shijie, of course, um, Jiang Tingfu, who I've written about elsewhere, distinguished historian, goes on to be, um, China, you mentioned the UN, China's first ambassador to the United Nations, um, including after uh, the, the, the flight to Taiwan when uh, China keeps the seat. Uh, all the way till 1971, as is well known. Mei Ru Ao, um, who actually, um, I think I can reveal here, I hope it's no, no, not uh, giving away secrets, that the wonderful Princeton historian Gary Bass is writing a big new history of the Tokyo war crimes trial, should be out next year. And he's got a lot of materials about uh, Mei Ru Ao, the Chinese jurist on the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, the Tokyo trials of 1948. And again, same pedigree, you know, constitutional law, speaks good English, um, understands the world in terms of a kind of cosmopolitan uh, liberalism that China could be part of. So what happens to these folks? Well, you know, some of them do stay behind, actually, in the mainland after 1949. In some cases, their hopes are, are somewhat disappointed, as you can imagine. Uh, someone like uh, uh, Zhu Kejian, who's um, president of uh, what would become Hangzhou University, and he has the option to flee to Taiwan. He doesn't. He stays behind. Um, same is true with you know, a variety of those other characters, but many of them do go to Taiwan. And I think there they continue actually to straddle that very difficult position that they were in even before 1949, which was a feeling on the one hand, in many cases, that they do not find the authoritarian nature of the dominant faction in the Kuomintang at all to their taste. You could add Hu Shi to that list as well, actually, as sort of an you know, archetypal liberal in many ways. And Jiang Tingfu, you know, some of these people, Wang Shijie was actually a member of the Kuomintang. Jiang Tingfu, for instance, was never actually, I'm pretty sure, a party member, and at one point writes a letter to a friend joking, saying that, you know, he would like to start a Chinese liberal party, but it has to be said that if you can choose one moment in 20th century history to start a liberal party in China, early 1948 is probably not the moment I would choose. The, 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 the atmosphere is not perhaps propitious for, uh, for that kind of, uh, kind of thinking. The point is that these people were making a compromise, and they were very aware of the compromise, which is that the government that they saw before them, the Kuomintang government, was not one that they found congenial in terms of its liberalism of attitude or indeed its global stance. But they saw and understood that the only alternative was not a liberal party, 
but the Communist Party. And for their own reasons, which you can agree or disagree with, they regarded this particular Soviet-influenced Communist Party as being a much greater uh, disaster for China. And again, history has done what history will do. You can go back and say what you think about that. But I will say that I wrote an article which came out last year in Comparative Studies and Society and History about Jiang Tingfu, and it ended actually with a, a little bit that was in a speech he was giving to a, a dinner club in, in Washington, I think, in about 1950, after the communist takeover of, of, of the mainland. Um, and I think in the end, the bit that he, I, I put it, uh, check the original manuscript, uh, it was actually scored out, so he may not have actually given it in the final version, but he thought it. And what he said was basically, you, meaning the Americans, are giving our government, or the government which I've supported, a very hard time. But in a few years' time, you may look back on us with regret, saying, realizing that you could have dealt with us a lot more easily than the people who are coming in next. And again, as I say, I put it merely there as something that was on his mind in 1950. It's to others to judge 70 or 80 years on whether or not that was a prescient sort of statement or not. But the thing that it does show is that these people were deeply self-aware. They were not ignorant of the political dilemma that they had to straddle, but they were also aware that the historical moment, through no fault of their own individually necessarily, had left them with you know, almost no choice. That's actually a really nice segue to the next question I want to pose to you. And it's it's a question, and I, I'm just going to sort of set it up and put it in context for a moment, because I'd like to you to perhaps address the specific question, but then say something uh, beyond that. It's a question I really, really about that that the sort of who lost China debate um, that was, of course, you know, has of course shaped our field for for decades. Um, mm. Tony Booth asks whether Ambassador Hurley was the greatest disaster for for U.S. China yeah. relations, and and what was FDR thinking at the time? Um, I'm interested. You, you may have something to say about that specific, you know, point, mm -hmm. but more generally. You know, where are we now on that question of, of the who lost China debate um, and, and how in the current state of, of US-China relations, I mean, how do we mm. think about um, US reflections of, of these different kind of moments of, of interaction with, with different sides of, uh, of the Chinese Civil War and that, that immediate sort of post-war period? Um, have, has, is that debate being re revisited, I guess, in, in the American Academy, in the Chinese Academy today, in a way that, it, you know, it was back in the 1990s, for example? Yeah. Uh, I think it's absolutely relevant to the present day in various ways. Let me just answer the question about ambassadors first. I think um, ambassadors distinguish people, and I think all of us in this conversation, you know, know at least a, a, a few of them. They possibly make slightly less history than they would like to think that they uh, they, uh, they they do. I mean, Hurley, for those who don't know, you know, Patrick J. Hurley, the um, um, last American ambassador, I think, sent under Roosevelt, first under Truman, I guess, um, in 1945 to, uh, to, 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 to China, who was um, not a great expert on China. He referred to the Chinese communist leader as, quote, Moose Dung, that's how he pronounced his name, um, and uh, referred to the Chinese nationalist general, I suppose, Mr. Shek, as in Chiang Kai Shek. Uh, so he used to also give apparently the Choctaw war cry in um, uh, homage to his own uh, apparently Native American roots. So, you know, yeah, rather surprised, I think, the, uh, the communist leadership when he, when he did that. So quite how tactful he was as a leader is another question. But, you know, you could say, I think I mentioned it briefly in the lecture, a year later, not as an ambassador, but as a special envoy, George C. Marshall spent a year in China trying to negotiate between the nationalists and the communists. And if you were going to choose one person who was the, you know, American statesman of the greatest distinction of that era, it's probably George Marshall. And he couldn't do it either. So how much difference I think that makes uh, in terms of the personality uh, is, is a moot question. I think it gets to the wider point, which is I think the who lost China debate has some time ago moved on to Nobody lost China because it wasn't anyone else's to lose. The Chinese Civil War is about Chinese people, of course, influenced by the Soviets and the Americans, but Chinese people fighting a war to work out which economic, political and social settlement ultimately would be um, dominant, a sort of revisionist, authoritarian, welfarist nationalism in the form of the Guomindang, or a transformative and often very violent social revolution in the form of the communists, and of course, as we know, the latter uh, won. I think, though, echoes of that debate are back with us in the present day, and I speak as someone who was in you know, Washington, D.C. just last week having a chat with a few informed people and you know, seeing 
where they uh, where they are. And by the way, one thing I w- obviously wouldn't reveal any you know <laughs> names or, or details of what they what they said. But a general thing that I think is worth noting, and I, I at least thought was heartening, was that. Despite what you sometimes read, there isn't just one view in Washington. There is actually, you know, obviously people are very concerned about the growing difficulties in US-China relations, to put it mildly, but that there is a spectrum of views as to how that should be handled. And I think as long as those debates are going on, it gives hope that there might well be some sort of um, sense that there's a negotiation to be, uh, to be had. But in terms of attitudes, I think that the thing that's different about China in the 1940s is that to some extent, what goes on inside China actually is relevant mainly to China itself. And that sounds like almost a truism, but the point being that actually in the end, the Truman administration made the perhaps you know, callous but necessary calculation in the context that the Communist Party was going to win, the nationalists weren't worth saving, and that the fall of the nationalist regime would not actually be a matter of you know, transformative global importance for um, the emergence of American power in the in the world. Now, I think there are, you know, whether or not that judgment is right is another question. But certainly, we know that the Cold War continued uh, with a China that was essentially frozen out of contact with the Western world, but in which that bet that essentially China wasn't going to be central to the way in which the world worked um, was probably borne out in a broad sense. I think the difficulty comes now in the fact that, as has become you know, a cliche, there's almost nothing in the world, whether it's economics, technology, military, cultural issues, that doesn't concern China in some way. And therefore, to that extent, in a moment when, in you know, a way that Shuang Shijie could only have dreamed of, but it really has, has happened, there is a genuinely global role for China. The corollary of that, which is the so far kind of rather difficult task of working out how China's presence in the world is actually going to shape countries outside China's borders is still an ongoing project. So I think that that question, maybe not so much of uh, who loses or wins China, but how China's you know, global project, global mission, all the things which we mentioned very explicitly in party congress uh, speeches and elsewhere, is actually going to affect the wider world is much more of a direct issue now than in reality, I think it turned out to be in the 1940s, even though there was fear at the time of, uh, uh, of, a, of a communist China becoming a sort of um, dynamo for further uh, uh, spread of ideology beyond that. Rana, a final question for you. And it's sort of, it's linking this idea that this, this post-war moment um, is of course of great significance for China today in terms of its thinking about its role as a global actor, and it's as you said, its influence on other Asian nations. Uh, it's symbolic, if if anything, if more than anything, uh, role as a, the only Asian member, the only sort of sovereign, independent Asian member of the the Permanent Five. Um, to what extent do you think the Chinese government today, or Chinese elites, or intellectuals today, look back to the 1940s, to that post war moment, to think about the role that they might play in terms of that? That influence on other Asian nations or other developing countries more generally. You spoke in your in your lecture about the, the you know the, the the ideas that Wang Shijie, for example, had uh, about playing a role in Europe. But in its immediate region, do you see much reflection of that that sort of that linking between today and the 1940s in terms of the the, the regional role that China might play or its role as as sort of the pioneer among developing countries? Uh, no, really interesting question. I would say that. Current Chinese engagement with memories, collective memories of the late 1940s is problematic because, you know, although I've tried to downplay it a little bit, there's a huge and very, very um, turbulent civil war that sits in the middle of it. And that's still ideologically very difficult for uh, the current um, Chinese um, uh, party to deal with. I would say there's one particular aspect, though, of the of the period we're talking about, the late 1940s, that is, I think, uh, brought up quite frequently, and I've written about it briefly elsewhere, but you know, just, to, just to bring it up. That's the new concentration on China's role as a founder of the United Nations. And that 1945 moment, which actually, of course, technically happens even before the war in Asia is over, because it's spring, basically, of April 1945 in San Francisco. And the Chinese Communist Party has you know, previously uh, in the uh, Mao era and even in the early reform era, wouldn't really talk about that moment at all. Uh, and there's one very obvious reason for that, that essentially the vast majority of the delegation that went to San Francisco, of course, is figures from the nationalist government, the recognized government of China at the time. Although, 
there was, after some pressure, one communist delegate, uh, Dong Biwu, who actually took part in the, uh, um, uh, the negotiations as well. But today, or at least in the present day, you can hear leaders, you can hear Xi Jinping, you can hear Wang Yi, you can hear other people going to public venues, Munich Security Conference uh, would be one example of that, but there are plenty of others, and making a very explicit point that China should be regarded as, today, should be regarded as one of the guardians of global order because it was, amongst other things, not just a signatory, but the first signatory to the United Nations Charter. Now, while technically true, that has more to do with alphabetical order and other things as well, but, you know, fair enough. But the point is that there's ownership now being claimed by today's Chinese Communist Party of an event and an institution which were very, very much downgraded, if not even taboo, because of the history, first of all, of being excluded entirely from the UN for you know, a quarter of a century, from 49 to 71. And then beyond that, a feeling that actually this wasn't an institution that played according to rules that did much good to China. And the turnaround in China's realization in the present day that actually the United Nations has many aspects that can be of great use to China, whether it's chairmanship of international organizations like the International Telecommunications Union or the Human Rights Council, or using the UN General Assembly as a sort of sounding board for um, projects in which China's preference for economic collectivism over individual liberties can be promoted amongst like-minded members. All of that is then underpinned, well, it's underpinned by a lot of things, but one of them is a recasting and reappropriation of that 1940s history by saying, you know what, Dean Acheson style, we were present at the creation, this is our thing too, and you know we were there you know, first on the, uh, first signatories to the uh, to the charter, and therefore we gain ownership and rights in terms of how this works. And whatever you think of it, that's a very different message from this United Nations thing was invented by Westerners. It has nothing to do with us. We you know only got brought in at the last minute. That's very much not the message that comes from the way in which the 1940s is invoked to uh, give to uh, give today's China ownership over something that was actually signed off, I think specifically, if I remember correctly, by the then Nationalist Prime Minister, Song Zhongwu and TV Song. Well, thank you, Rana. I think we've we've almost reached time, so it's a it's a good moment uh, to stop to think about, I guess, what you've your, what you've been uh, reminding of us uh, this evening, and that's that that link between the 1940s and today, and and thinking about how the legacy uh, of the post-war period um, continues to to be felt uh, in China today. Uh, thank you for an extraordinarily stimulating lecture. It's been wonderful to, to bring you live from Oxford early in the morning um, to us here in Australia and, and beyond uh, this evening. Uh, let me say a few other thank yous now. Um, thank you to our audience for, for joining us here. Um, there will be a recording of this lecture made available um, through the Australian Centre on China in the World uh, in the coming days. So if you'd like to look back, please do. Thank you in particular as well, though, to, to Sharon Strange, to Nancy Chu and to Xiao Yusun um, at the Australian Centre on China and the World for their incredible help in, in putting things together this evening, uh, to Luca Vitassi uh, here at the ANU uh, and to Karen Carey and her team uh, in Oxford for their help on the AV side of things at their end. To my fellow um, organisers on the Morrison Lecture Series Committee, um, Dr Mark Strange and Associate Professor Ben Penny, thank you for, for your assistance in, in putting together tonight's lecture. Uh, and we very much look forward to uh, to hosting you next year uh, for what will be the 84th uh, annual George Morrison Lecture. Uh, but let me once again uh, say a very, very warm thank you uh, to Rana Mitter. Uh, I hope we can see you uh, in person here before too long uh, here in Australia. But for now, thank you so much. Uh, and and uh, thank you for a wonderful Morrison Lecture this evening. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining in today. It's been a pleasure.